Good afternoon, History Center members. My name's Leslie. If you haven't met me yet, I'm the Museum Services Manager and I'm the curator of this suffrage exhibit. Voices for the Vote, the struggle for women's suffrage was actually a combination of me and Glenn's idea. Um, I had looked at a couple of other suffrage exhibits that were on display this year. Um, and I, I wanted to create something completely different, something that wouldn't tie us to other exhibits. Um, and Glenn and I actually combined and came up with this one. I really enjoy this title. So let's take a look at the exhibit and let's go around and look at all the artifacts. So one of the most important moments in the women's suffrage was the very first convention in Rochester, New York. It was the Seneca Falls Convention. Um, one of the most important things is that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, who were very important figures in the suffrage movement, started at this convention. Um, also, another prominent figure was Frederick Douglass, a former slave and also a huge advocate of women's suffrage. After a long conversation over a cup of tea, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott decided they had enough with inequalities women faced. They called for action and within days of their meeting established the first women's suffrage convention in Rochester, New York. The convention spanned two days, the first day exclusively for women, the second to include men. Frederick Douglass, a former slave and leader of the abolition movement, attended the convention and was one of a handful of men to support women's suffrage. Douglass, Stanton, Mott, and 300 in attendance signed the Declaration of Sentiments a document calling for women's equality in politics, family, education, and occupational opportunities. While the Civil War halted the women's suffrage movement, they would pick up where they had left off in the late 1800s as a powerful force for change. I cannot say enough about Frederick Douglass and his contribution to women's suffrage, um, which is why one of the reasons why I created a panel for him. Um, he, even when uh, white women did not want Frederick Douglass at the suffrage conventions because it would be a faux pas with the white men in the South, he still supported them regardless. He was a great person and an incredible advocate, and he's perfect for the women's suffrage movement. And that's why we also added in the exhibit a speech he gave, actually performed by one of our favorite actors, Mustafa Slack. So here's the video for you to watch. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I received from your honored president an invitation to be present this evening, I neither expected nor aspired to come before you at this important state of your proceeding. I am but only a humble layman in the woman's suffrage church. I do not know that I am in good and regular standing. Even that much of it which holds its annual meetings in the place where I reside. Yet, I am sure that I am thoroughly in sympathy with the woman's suffrage movement and am working for its advancement. I can say, however, without the slightest affection of diffidence, that I prefer that some other person, someone of the noble women I see around me, who by ability, eloquence, and devotion to this cause is entitled to and should occupy the post of honor now allotted to me. Man has at best a very moderate claim to prominence on this platform. He may well feel himself sufficiently honored if admitted even to take a back seat. He is the sinner, woman, is the preacher. She is our own best advocate. On such occasions as this, she holds the post of honor and the post of usefulness by virtue of her moral sovereignty and by right of her superior efficiency. No man, however eloquent, can speak for a woman as a woman can speak for herself. Nevertheless, I hold that this cause is not altogether and exclusively woman's cause. It is the cause of human brotherhood as well as the cause of human sisterhood. And both must rise and fall together. 
Woman cannot be elevated without elevating man. And man cannot be depressed without depressing woman also. I used to say, if you want to keep a man out of the mud, you should black his boots. If you want him to expect something of himself, you must expect something of him. I say the same of woman. Throw around her robes of power and dignity of complete citizenship. Make her responsible for the good or ill of the republic. Make her see that she is something more than a cipher in this world. And she will develop a character higher than is now dreamed of in her present dwarfed condition. She will feel her responsibility. She will inform herself on the questions uppermost in the state and will qualify herself to pass upon them and be more fully a companion of man than ever before. Exalted as she now is in this country over the women of the Eastern world, she will be more exalted when she shall, as she certainly will, achieve her complete citizenship and suffrage While Frederick Douglass was more commonly known as being a leader in the abolition movement, he was also a strong advocate for women's rights. Regardless of repeated criticism from his colleagues, his alliance for women did not falter. Douglass believed the world would be a better place if women could vote and spent 47 years of his life as an orator for the rights of women. So the suffrage movement actually hit a snag. Um, there were um, complications with the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. Um, the NWSA, which was Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, believed that they deserved the right to vote before black men. So the AWSA was created by Lucy Stone, who believed that black men should deserve the right to vote. Um, this separation split the suffrage movement for about 80 years, and we didn't actually get any progress in until the 1900s. In 1869, the women's suffrage movement split in two. The National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association were created following the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, founders of the NWSA, were of the opinion that women should receive the right to vote before black men. Lucy Stone, her husband Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, and Josephine Ruffin supported the 15th Amendment and believed the support of black male voters would further the cause for women's suffrage. The organizations caused continual strife for one another and did not come together as one until AWSA merged with NWSA in 1890 after the retirement of Stanton and Anthony. New leaders of the movement would finally give women the unified voice they needed to be heard in America. So as I talked about before, Lucy Stone was the president of the AWSA. That was the other suffrage movement um, other than the NWSA. Um, Lucy Stone was a very prominent figure in the women's suffrage movement. Um, she also was the first woman to receive a degree in Massachusetts. Uh, she constantly went for women's rights, including not having to take a man's surname. She was an incredible woman, and that's why our very own Libba Beecham created a video about her in our exhibit. From the first years to which my memory stretches, I have been a disappointed woman. When with my brothers I reached forth after the sources of knowledge, I was reproved with it isn't fit for you. It doesn't belong to women. Then there was but one college in the world where women were admitted, and that was in Brazil. I would have found my way there, but by the time I was prepared to go, one was opened in the young state of Ohio, the first in the United States where women and Negroes could enjoy opportunities with white men. I was disappointed when I came to seek a profession worthy an immortal being, Every employment was closed to me except for that of the teacher, the seamstress, and the housekeeper. In education, in marriage, in religion, in everything, disappointment is the lot of woman. 
It shall be the business of my life to deepen this disappointment in every woman's heart until she bows down to it no longer. I wish that women, instead of being walking showcases, instead of begging their fathers and brothers the latest and gayest new bonnet, would ask of them their rights. The question of woman's rights is a practical one. The notion has prevailed that it was only an ephemeral idea, that it was but women claiming the right to smoke cigars in the streets and to frequent bar rooms. Others have supposed it a question of comparative intellect, others still of sphere. Too much has already been said and written about woman's sphere. Trace all the doctrines to their source and they will be found to have no basis except in the usages and prejudices of the age. This is seen in the fact that what is tolerated in woman in one country is not tolerated in another. In this country, women may hold prayer meetings and the like, but in Mohammedan countries, it is written upon their mosques, women and dogs and other impure animals are not permitted to enter. Wendell Phillips says, the best and greatest thing one is capable of doing, that is his sphere. I have confidence in the Father to believe that when he gives us the capacity to do anything, he does not make a blunder. Leave women then to find their sphere, and do not tell us before we are born even that our province is to cook dinners, darn stockings, and sew on buttons. We are told woman has all the rights she wants, and even women, I am ashamed to say, tell us so. They mistake the politeness of men for rights, seats while men stand in this hall tonight, and their adulations, but these are mere courtesies. We want rights. The flower merchant, the house builder, the postage man charges us no less on account of our sex. But when we endeavor to earn money to pay all these, then indeed we find the difference. Man, if he have any energy, may hew out for himself a path where no mortal has ever trod, held back by nothing but what is in himself. The world is all before him, where to choose, and, and we are glad for you, brothers, men, that that is so. But the same society that drives forth the young man keeps woman at home, a dependent, working little cats on worsted and little dogs on punctured paper. But if she goes heartily and bravely to give herself to some worthy purpose, she is out of her sphere and she loses caste. Women working in tailor shops are paid one-third as much as the men working in tailor shops. Someone in Philadelphia has stated that women make fine shirts for twelve and a half cents apiece. That no woman can make more than nine a week, and the sum has thus earned after reducing the rent and fuel and such, leaves her just three and a half cents a day for bread. Is it any wonder? that women are driven to prostitution? Female teachers in New York are paid $50 a year, and every such situation there are at least 500 applications. I know not what you believe in God, but I believe he gave yearnings and longings to be filled, and that he did not mean all our time should be devoted to feeding and clothing the body. The present condition of woman causes a horrible perversion of the marriage relation. It is asked of a lady, has she married well? Oh yes, her husband is rich. Woman must marry for a home, and you men are the sufferers by this. For a woman who loathes you may marry you because you have the means to get money which she cannot have. But when woman can enter the lists with you and make money for herself, she will marry you only for deep an earnest affection. I am detaining you too long, many of you standing, that I ought to apologize, but women have been wrong so long that I may wrong you a little. I have seen a woman at manual labor turning out chair legs in a cabinet shop with a dress short enough not to drag in the shavings. I wish other women would imitate her in this. It made her hands harder and broader, it is true, 
But I think a hand with a dollar and a quarter a day in it better than one with a crossed ninepence. The widening of woman's sphere is to improve her lot. Let us do it. And if the world scoff, let it scoff. And if it sneer, let it sneer. Lucy Stone, an abolitionist and suffragist, dedicated 50 years of her life to the fight for equal rights. She was the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree and continued to defy gender roles when she refused to take the name of her husband, suffragist Henry Blackwell. Lucy Stone was the leader of the American Women's Suffrage Association and was the editor of the Women's Journal, a newspaper devoted to women's suffrage. So as archives manager, I wanted to share some of my favorite pieces that would go during the women's suffrage movement. This is a late Victorian morning dress. It was around the 1880s. Um, it actually is an artifact from our, our archives and was worn by a woman in one of our photographs, which Liv will show for everybody. Um, it's a beautiful piece and it actually is very light, believe it or not. Um, I think it might be made of silk or taffeta. While studying abroad, suffragist leader Alice Paul observed the militant tactics used in the British women's suffrage movement and became inspired to do the same. These tactics included picketing, hunger strikes, marches, and camping at the White House. Calling themselves the Silent Sentinels, Paul and others were considered traitors to the president and to America. Paul and suffragist Lucy Burns were arrested after a march for obstruction of traffic and, while there, were subjected to physical and verbal abuse. The press learned of the abuse and wrote about it extensively, giving women the national attention they needed to garner support from President Woodrow Wilson. The 19th Amendment passed in 1919 and was ratified in 1920. The 19th Amendment enfranchised 26 million women in America. Immediately following the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Alice Paul began working on the Equal Rights Amendment, which she believed was a necessary step in ensuring equality for all women. For most women in Georgia, the right to vote was not an issue that evoked widespread concern. During Reconstruction, men and women tried to pick up the pieces and rebuild the South. The suffrage movement did not gain momentum in Georgia until 1890 with the creation of the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association. And in 1892, the Committee on Southern Work, a subchapter of the NWSA. While both organizations fought for suffrage, an anti-suffrage movement was forming. The National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was founded in 1895, and by 1914, the group had over 2,000 members, a number far greater than pro-suffrage organizations. The women of the anti-suffrage movement opposed suffrage because they believed women should obey their husbands, believing men had their best interests at heart. The 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. However, because of the pushback from anti-suffrage, women did not receive the right to vote in Georgia until 1922. That right was not recognized in the state constitution until 1970. So this is the yearbook we do have on hand from Brunel. We actually are on Brunel campus. This is part of Brunel. So uh, it's really cool artifact that we have. This is the Bubbles, their yearbook from 1915, and this is the Suffrage Club. This is one of the only ones that we could find with the Suffrage Club in it. In the mid-19th century, there was a movement amongst the upper-class Americans to advocate for more equal education for women in both difficulty and content as their male peers. Until this point, women's education focused on domestic duties in the arts, subjects seen as valuable for future homemakers. Bernal College, founded as Georgia Baptist Female Seminary in 1878, was one of the first colleges opened for women. It included all of the traditionally feminine subjects, but added some of the subjects traditionally offered to men only, such as math and science. This approach brought local women out of the home and into the public sphere, giving them a space to voice their opinions and influence their communities. By 1915, the school had a student-run newspaper called the Bernal Journal, many sorority organizations, and even a suffrage club. So I think this actually is my favorite case. Um, these are all artifacts from the archives. Um, here we have a voter registration book from the 1800s. Um, it's in great condition considering how old it is. Um, we have a tintype photo album that would have been used, uh, a soldier could have carried it with them in the 1800s in the Civil War. There's still photos all in there. It's really great photos. 
Um, this is one of my favorite ones from the album. Then we have um, an actual oil lamp that was donated, which is really great and it still works. And then over here we have some photos of women from Hall County. Um, the, they're all very interesting, beautiful photos in great condition. Um, and this one's actually one of my favorites because she's smiling, which is really uncommon at that time. From its beginning in 1818, Hall County struggled to grow and became a business and social hub for the region. In 1871, when Gainesville established a train station at the foot of Main Street, the city became connected to the nation. Businesses sprang up near the depot, creating economic success and, in turn, more middle-class families. The photographs in this case are middle and upper-class women of Hall County, ranging from 1870 to 1888. So this case is dedicated to domestic housework. It actually was Marie and Glenn's idea, and since they uh, gave the idea, I really love it. Um, these are items that would have been done with the domestic housework. So we have, um, this is a wrought iron. It's insanely heavy. Uh, we have some cabinet keys here. Um, this one is probably everyone's favorite piece, and it's actually really interesting. This is a curling iron, but they would have taken here there's a little knob here, and a brick would have gone in it, heated the apparatus like that, and then you'd curl your hair, which we still are trying to figure out how you would do that without burning yourself. But it's really interesting, and look at how tiny the curls would have been. Following the Civil War, domestic work was the main source of income for many lower class white and black women. Duties of a domestic worker included cooking, cleaning, laundry, shopping, and providing care for children and the elderly. Organizations like the American Women's Suffrage Association work to give women the opportunity to be more than a domestic work with minimum pay. Artifacts in this case are examples of items used by women of the period to take care of the home. This is a linen dress we actually have in the archives. It's from the 1910s, but it would have been something worn in the 1920s around the turn of the decade. And this is a sash actually made by Marie Walker. Some of you might have seen it in the raffle. This case is basically everyone else's favorite. This is the fashion case. Um, something I really wanted to showcase was now we had black women in our archives. We have beautiful photos here in incredible condition. Um, we also have a hat pin that I found, and um, this actually was donated by Marie. This is a purse from the 1920s made of chainmail. Um, this is a belt buckle, and this is these are some photos in the 1910s and the 1920s. Um, there's a hair clip here that's beautiful gold. And then we had shoes from the turn of the century. The 1920s saw new styles that reflected the modernization going on in the world around it. Styles for dresses became simplistic and more androgynous than in the Edwardian era. This simplicity created the popular tubular Le Garcone look that dominated much of the decade. Also known as the flapper, the look typified the 20s dress with a dropped waist and rising hemlines that could be created in economical fabrics. Looser clothing revealed more of the arms and legs. Evening dresses sometimes still nearly reached the ground, though many of the popular styles followed the hemline trends of day wear. Many women cut their hair into a bob, a popular hairstyle that emerged early in the decade. Hairstyles kept getting shorter first with the shingle and then with the Eaton crop. The cloche hat became an extremely popular accessory that looked best with these short hairstyles. The 20s ushered in a fashion style that reflected the new modern age. Something I just wanted to share was the different colors for British suffrage and women's suffrage. Um, British suffrage seen here and American suffrage seen here. Purple is the color of loyalty, constancy to purpose unswerving steadfastness to the cause. White, the emblem of purity, symbolizes the quality of our purpose, and gold, the color of light and life, is as the torch that guides our purpose, pure and unswerving. The Suffragists, 1913. In 1910, Britain first began the use of symbolic colors for the suffrage movement to stand out during their cause. Their colors were purple for royalty, green for hope, and white for purity. 
America followed with their own colors three years later. One of the things that I really wanted to touch on was the African American movement and women's suffrage. While it's not really well known much about them, um, they were a very big part of the women's suffrage movement in the 1800s. When white women were given the vote in Chicago in 1910, they attempted to ban black women from also being able to vote. The Alpha Suffrage Club, formed by co-founder of the NAACP, Ida B. Wells, fought back and worked to promote the election of black men and women to public office. The protests and demonstrations made by the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the club helped push the 19th Amendment to pass in 1920. I'm really excited to talk to you about this next person. Her name is Victoria Woodhull. A lot of you might not recognize her. She actually was the first woman to run for president twice in the 1800s, over 50 years before women were able to vote. And her running mate was Frederick Douglass. She was a huge advocate for women's suffrage. Um, I can't say enough about her. She was an amazing woman and she went on to help the women's suffrage movement and become one of the first women on the New York Stock Exchange. Victoria Woodhull announced her candidacy for president in 1872 with the Equal Rights Party 38 years before women received the right to vote. She wanted to create a new constitution and a new government comprised of men and women. The Equal Rights Party chose Frederick Douglass as her running mate. Woodhull ran two more times in 1884 and 1892 with a goal to give women the vote. So those of you who don't know, James Longstreet is a very prominent figure in Gainesville. Um, he was a part of the Confederacy, but when the Civil War ended, he became a Republican. So one of the figures that was important after the Civil War was James Longstreet and also Helen Dorch Longstreet. This was his wife. Um, she was a prominent figure in North Georgia when he passed away. She helped with the suffrage movement. She helped with the Civil Rights Movement. She also helped Oh, she was one of Rosie the Riveters in Atlanta. She was a very prominent figure, and we actually really love Helen here. So while the amendment passed in 1920, obviously the movement was far from over. Um, black women still were suppressed in the right to vote, so we wanted to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment um, with the Civil Rights Movement and how um, these women helped get the right to vote for black women. Although the women's suffrage movement ended with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, for African American women, it was only the beginning to the long journey in securing their constitutional right to vote. Voter suppression was the reality for the majority of African Americans for decades, especially in the South. African American activists believed that through voting, the laws, and consequently their conditions would change. During the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, Many women of different backgrounds did their part to increase voter registration by setting up areas to register in local communities. These efforts included educating African Americans who could not read and write, hosting political meetings in the local churches to inform communities, and forming political societies of their own. In 1964, the voter registration project Freedom Summer in Mississippi was spearheaded by African American women who successfully registered 1,600 African American voters by the end of summer, despite being met with violent opposition. Because of the efforts of civil rights activists, especially the women's efforts, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. The act eliminated discriminatory voting practices and protects the right to vote for women of color. So some people might know about Bloody Sunday. It was the march from Selma with Martin Luther King. Um, these were the two women that actually helped organize the movement. Um, they were very important um, to the inspiration of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Amelia Boynton Robinson and Marie Foster were key figures in the events that led to the march in Selma, Alabama. Becoming the first two female members of the Dallas County Voters League, their efforts consisted of promoting voter registration and education in Dallas County, Alabama. Both women planned the first march protesting discrimination at the voting booths that would come to be known as Bloody Sunday. Days later, they would inspire another march in Selma to Montgomery and would influence the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Ella Josephine Baker left her mark fighting for African American rights to vote in the civil rights movement. Holding a position of leadership in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Baker launched the Crusade for Citizenship campaign that focused on voting rights in Atlanta, Georgia. 
In later years, she established the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was responsible for the 1964 Freedom Summer Voting Rights Campaign in Mississippi. Not only were they able to register hundreds of African American voters, but they also brought national attention to the unfair politics in the state. So this display is dedicated to the 1960s and 70s. Um, these actually are some artifacts we had in our archives. This is the Gainesville Hall County Provisional League of Women Voters scrapbook. Um, it actually had a lot of these articles in it, but one of the things that I think is very interesting and a little bit sad is the newspaper article about the ERA. Thanks everyone for coming by. I really hope you enjoyed it. I'm incredibly proud of this exhibit and I hope to see you sometime in the future. Thanks for coming.